Hello, and welcome to this course introduction on Build Your Own Linux Kernel from Scratch. In this course, we're going to start with this brief introduction and overview of the topics and configurations that we'll cover in this course. Then we'll talk about creating the build environment. And in this section, we'll talk about the differences between kernels, operating systems, and distribution, as well as preparing for the build and setting up our virtual machine. Then we'll talk about building the kernel. And in this section, we'll download and extract the source code install the required packages, configure and build our kernel, and update the bootloader. Then we'll verify our environment and have a hands-on lab on building your own Linux kernel. Next, we'll jump into customizing the kernel. And in this section, we'll talk about optimizing the kernel for the cloud. And then we'll discuss creating a Linux distribution with a part one and a part two. Then we'll have a quiz on creating your own Linux kernel. Then we'll hop into our course conclusion section, where we'll have a course summary on the topics and configurations that we discussed in this course, as well as what could be next for you on your educational journey with a Cloud Guru. So if this sounds like something that you may be interested in, go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this lesson about the training architect. In this lesson, I'll talk a bit about my background and provide some context as to how and why I write lessons the way that I do. So let's get started. So my name is Kara Nolte, and I have 22 years of experience in information technology. I have a strong foundation in Unix and Linux systems, including systems administration, engineering, and architecture. I filled roles such as sysadmin, systems engineer, technical account manager, and training architect. I started my career in the tape library, storing magnetic data storage tape. So my career started in the tape library, working with data storage tapes and magnetic tape silos. So the data that's stored on these tapes is requested by a server, and then the robot silo will pull that from its catalog and mount it for use by the mainframe. From there, I went into Unix and Linux server operations. And this is where I really learned how teams of teams come together to support a production environment. And this is where I first got my exposure to Linux and Unix servers. I've worked for companies such as IBM, Hewlett Packard, Accenture, Atos, General Electric, Red Hat, and now a Cloud Guru. So if you're interested in getting connected or collaborating, you can leave feedback on the lessons and labs and engage in the course forums, but you can also find me in the Linux room on Discord, as well as on LinkedIn and on Twitter. But that's it for this lesson. Go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next section. Hello, and welcome to this section, Creating the Build Environment. In this section, we'll talk about what the kernel is and how to prepare or kernel build. After this brief introduction, we'll discuss the differences between kernels, operating systems, and distribution. Preparing for the build, including any information you need to gather before starting your build, and setting up our virtual machine, which talks about the types of platforms that you can use to build your kernel, and the benefits of using a virtual machine. Then we'll wrap up this section with our section conclusion. So if you're ready to get started, I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll talk about what is a kernel, what is an operating system, and what is a distribution. And you've probably heard of Linux referred to as each one of these. So what exactly is the difference between a kernel OS and a distribution? And what is Linux? So a Linux system begins with a kernel. It can then have more features added to become an operating system. And then if you want specific applications or features added to your operating system, it becomes a specific Linux distribution. But first, let's talk about the kernel. The kernel is the central piece of code for Linux. And you can't have Linux without having a kernel. 
The kernel is the brain of Linux and the core interface between the computer's hardware and its processes. It's the core of the operating system, and it has four jobs. The first is memory management. It keeps track of how much memory is used to store what and where. It's also responsible for process management and determining what processes can use the CPU, when they can use it, and for how long. It's responsible for device drivers to act as a mediator or interpreter between the hardware and the processes. And then it's also responsible for system calls and security, receiving requests for service from the processes. So then, what is an operating system? An operating system is a set of applications and packages that are added for services. It provides functionality for scheduling tasks, executing applications, and controlling peripherals. So an OS includes the kernel and then also system services, applications, and user accounts so that users can interact within that system. So now, what is a Linux distribution? Well, a distribution is a set of specific software packages added to the Linux kernel. So it's also an operating system. So two Linux distributions could have the same kernel, but they could also have different applications and packages that are added to make it an operating system. And there are many Linux distributions available. So Linux is a kernel, an operating system, and a distribution, all at the same time. First, you build the kernel. Then you add services and packages that make it an operating system with a user interface. And then you can add specific packages and market it as your own Linux distribution. So in this lesson, we talked about what is a kernel, what is an operating system, and what is a distribution. Then we talked about that Linux is actually all three of these. So go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll talk about preparing for the build. We'll discuss preparing for the build, gathering information, choosing a platform, and choosing your kernel source code. So let's get started. So first, let's talk about the planning stage. This is a very important time to gather the information you'll need for the build so that you aren't scrambling for information during the building process. So you'll need a system running a Linux OS to build on. You'll also need at least 12 gigabytes of storage, access to the command line, and a user account with sudo root privilege. So first, we'll need a Linux system. So let's pick a platform to build on. You can use a standalone server running Linux, or a VirtualBox installation or other virtual installation running Linux. You can also use one of our Cloud Playground servers to build on, but whatever you choose to build on needs the 12 gigabytes of storage, and our Cloud Playground comes with 20 if you create your server there. It also provides command line access with a user account and sudo access. So now we're going to talk about the kernel source code. You aren't creating your Linux OS from scratch, so you'll need to download the kernel code to compile and complete your kernel build. Then you can add software and packages to create an operating system or a distribution. So best practice is to download the latest stable kernel, and you would find that at www.kernel.org. So the version numbers can change pretty quickly with updates, but you can see here on the screen that the latest available kernel is highlighted in the yellow box. But you should be able to use the latest one that is a verified stable release. So anything that says stable in the left-hand column. So in this lesson, we talked about preparing for the build, gathering information, choosing a platform, and choosing the kernel source code. So that's it for this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll talk about preparing our VM, satisfying our requirements, and building our platform to build a kernel on. 
So let's get started. So now let's talk about the building phase. In the last lesson, we talked about the platforms that you can use to build a Linux kernel, a standalone Linux server, a virtual box or other virtual installation, or one of our Cloud Playground servers. Our Cloud Playground provides multiple Linux distributions and versions, so it satisfies the requirement for having a running Linux OS. They also satisfy the requirement of having 12 gigabytes of storage, since each comes default with 20 gigabytes of storage per server. It also has a command line with a user account that also has sudo root privilege. So this will be my preferred method for building my kernel. And I do recommend using virtual machines because they're easy to build and more cost efficient as they don't use any hardware, power, or resources. So you can go into our cloud playground and click on the cloud servers tab, then select new server. Again, the servers come with 20 gigabytes of space, so any size is fine. But if you'd like to follow along my build process, you'll want to install a Debian 10 server. So now let's take a look at my terminal. So I'm logged into a Cloud Guru and I clicked on my playground. Then I went over and clicked on Cloud Servers. Now I'll click on New Server. I'll select the distribution and type in Debian. I'm going to select a Debian 10 image. For my zone, I'm located in North America. So I will select the North America location. And for a size, I'm going to select one unit because we're just building a kernel and not really adding a lot of additional features. Here I'm going to put kernel server, since that's where I'm building my kernel, and create server. So this will take a few minutes to complete, but as it progresses, you can click over here and it will display your credentials. So you'll have your username and your password, which you can log in via SSH to the server, enter the cloud user user account and your password, and then issue sudo-i, and that will give you root access to run any of the commands that you need to run during the installation. So again, this is still starting. So we have our public host name, our username and password, and when it completes, it will display the IP address of the server that you've just built. So now if we go back to the slide presentation, it will look like this. You'll have one Debian 10 server ready to build on. So in this lesson, we talked about setting up our virtual machine, which includes satisfying our requirements for the build, and building our platform. But that's it for this lesson. Please mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this section, creating the build environment, we started with a brief introduction. Then we talked about the differences between kernels operating systems and distribution, where we touched on what is a kernel, what is an operating system, and what is a distribution. And then we talked about how Linux is all three of these. Then we talked about preparing for the build and gathering the information you need for the technical build of the kernel. We gathered information such as a running Linux OS to build in, one that has 12 gigabytes of storage, and access to the command line, with a user account with sudo and root privileges. Then we talked about setting up our virtual machine for the build. We could use standalone hardware running Linux, VirtualBox or other virtual installation running Linux, or our Cloud Playground. Now we're wrapping up this section with our course conclusion. So go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next section. Hello, and welcome to this section, Building the Kernel. After this brief introduction, we'll jump into downloading and extracting the source code, where we'll download the source code onto our server and then extract it in order to compile our kernel. Then we'll talk about what the required packages are and installing the required packages. Next, we'll look at configuring and building the kernel. And this is where we'll build a new kernel from the original kernel source code, including installing the kernel there as well. Then we'll talk about updating the bootloader and verifying the environment. Then we'll wrap up this section with a short conclusion. But that's it for this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson.
Hello, and welcome to this lesson, Downloading and Extracting the Source Code. In this lesson, we'll talk about what is kernel source code and downloading the source code. We'll also talk about extracting the source code. So, what is kernel source code? The kernel code is really the brain of the operating system. It's at the center of everything, and it acts as an interface between the hardware and the software. Since it does have control over everything in the system, it needs to be readily available at all times. So for this reason, it always resides in memory. So we'll download the source code at kernel.org. And here, we'll check for the current kernel version. We see here the latest release is 6.0.2. So best practice is to download one release before the latest release, just for stability and bug fixes. So we'll be working with kernel version 6.0.1. So first, we'll extract the source code, and we'll use the wget command to download the software. And then we'll use the tar command to extract the source code. So for the demonstration, we'll download and extract the source code. So this means that first we'll download the code, and then we'll extract it. So now let's take a look at our terminal. So I've already checked kernel.org for the current kernel version, and we're going to download 6.0.1. So we're going to do wget https colon slash slash cdn.kernel.org slash pub slash linux slash kernel slash v 6.x, because this is version 6, and then Linux dash 6.0.1.tar.xz. And that's going to be the name of your kernel file. So here we see that we've downloaded the kernel. If you do an ls, you can see that the tar file is there. So let's clear the screen. And now we'll extract the source code. So we'll do tar xvf. Linux dash 6.0.1.tar.xz. And since this is a compressed tar file, this may take a few minutes to complete. So just go ahead and wait for this to finish, and then we can pick back up where we left off in the next lesson. So in this lesson, we talked about what is kernel source code. And we also talked about downloading the source code and extracting the source code. But that's it for this lesson, downloading and extracting the source code. Hello, and welcome to this lesson, installing the required packages. In this lesson, we'll talk about what are the required packages for a kernel build, and installing the required packages. So what are the required packages? So first, we're going to install git, and this is just a system that tracks source code changes during the development process. So git is a pretty popular development database. Fake root creates a fake root environment. And then build essential installs build development tools for source code. And build essential doesn't install software itself, but rather it's a meta package, which means that it creates links to other packages that are installed for dependencies. Incurses-dev is a source code development library, and xzutils is a utility for file compression. libssl-dev supports SSL and TSL authentication. bc is a programming language that provides basic arithmetic, which enables the creation of equations within scripts and other programs. Flex is a utility that converts characters into tokens. And libelf-dev is a shared development library for managing executable files, core dumps, and object code. So Bison is a parser generator, and it converts input into source code. So now let's talk about installing the packages. So we're going to install the required packages with the apt command since we're using a Debian server. So now we're going to switch to our demonstration where we're going to install the package list. So we're going to do apt 
install, git, fake root, build essential, and curses dev, xc utils, lib ssl dash dev, bc, flex, lib elf dev, and bison. So to continue, select yes. And this is a lot of packages, so this may take a while to install and complete successfully. So if it does, just wait for it to complete before we move on to the next exercise. And here we can see that all of our packages installed successfully. So in this lesson, we talked about what are the required packages for a kernel build. Git, fake root, build essential, and curses dev, xeutils, libssl-dev, BC, Flex, LibElf Dev, and Bison. And we also talked about installing the required packages. But that's it for this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, configuring and building the kernel, we'll talk about configuring kernel settings, as well as compiling the kernel. So first, we're going to change directory into the Linux kernel directory. And then we're going to copy the default configuration file into that directory location. Next, we're going to open the configuration file for editing and edit the directive config system trusted keys. Then we're going to run the make menu config command. And this command runs some configuration scripts. And then it opens up a menu for configuration settings. The menu includes many configuration options, but we're just going to take the defaults, select save, and then exit. Next, we're going to run the make command, and this is going to compile our kernel. So this command takes a very long time. The kernel has over 30 million lines of code to process. So if you'd like to pause this lesson and resume once that completes, then you can come back and complete the additional step. Next, we're going to install the required modules. And then we're going to install the compiled kernel. So next, we're going to do the demonstration, configuring and building the kernel. And we'll configure the kernel settings required to build the kernel. And then we'll compile and install the kernel. So now let's take a look at our terminal. So we're in our user's home directory. And if we do an ls, we see our Linux directory here. So I'm going to cd into that directory. I'll clear my screen. Then I'm going to copy the default configuration file. Copy, dash v, boot, config, dash dollar sign, open parentheses, uname dash r, close parentheses, asterisk. And we're going to copy that file to dot config. So we can see here the file was copied. Now we're going to clear the screen. And we're going to vim that configuration file. So we'll do vim.config. Now we're going to search for config underscore system underscore trusted. And here we see config system trusted keys. Now we're going to delete everything between the quotation marks. And then we're going to escape and write and quit our file. Now I'll clear the screen again. Now we'll run make menu config. And here we can see the scripts running. And then it opens to edit our configuration. So we're going to take the defaults here. We're not going to change anything. There's a lot of different settings that you can look through to fine tune your kernel. But for this exercise, we'll just select save. OK to save it to that same file name, and then exit. Then we'll exit again, and we're out of the menu. So I'll clear the screen. Now I'm going to run the make command, and this is going to compile our kernel. So again, I said that this can take a very long time. So if you'd like to pause this lesson, and then resume once this completes successfully. And I'm going to speed up the process for this lesson, but your installation will likely take a lot longer. and if your SSH session times out, you can do one of two things. You can add an ampersand at the end of the command, 
to run that command in the background, or you can edit your client timeout interval in your SSH config on whatever terminal you're using. So here we see that completed successfully. Now I'll clear the screen. And next, we're going to run the make modules underscore install command. And this one may take a few minutes to complete as well. Here we see it completed successfully, so we'll clear the screen. Next, we're going to install our kernel with make install. And that completed successfully. So in this lesson, we talked about configuring the kernel settings, and we also talked about compiling the kernel. So that's it for this lesson, configuring and building the kernel. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, updating the bootloader, we'll talk about what is a bootloader, as well as updating the bootloader. So let's get started. So what is a bootloader? So basically, when a server starts or is rebooted, the first piece of code that's loaded is the bootloader. And it basically loads the boot environment and runs the operating system and applications. So to update a bootloader, generally we would update the init RAM FS, but this step is already completed by the make install. But if you'd like, you can also run this command manually. We won't in this exercise, but it's here in case you need it since that is a step required to update the bootloader. And then to update the bootloader, we'll run sudo update-grub. So next, let's look at our demonstration for updating the bootloader. And here, we're going to configure the bootloader to load the boot environment. So let's take a look at our terminal. So again, the update init ramfs already runs with a make install command. So here, we just have to run update dash grub. And now we can see the bootloader was updated. So in this lesson, we talked about what is a bootloader and that it's the first piece of code that's loaded when the system is powered on. And then we updated the bootloader with the update dash grub command. But that's it for this lesson, updating the bootloader. Hello and welcome back. So in this lesson, we'll talk about verifying the updated kernel environment. So first, we're going to reboot the server and we have to do a reboot for our new kernel to boot and to become the new version. Then we're going to verify the kernel version with the uname command and the updated kernel version will be displayed here. So next, we're going to do a demonstration on verifying the environment. And we're going to ensure the new environment was built and run successfully. So let's take a look at our terminal. So first, we're going to reboot the server and we'll just type the reboot command here. So this will disconnect your SSH session, so you can pause this lesson and then resume once the server is rebooted and you've been able to log back in. So here I'm going to log back in, and to get root access here, I'm going to issue sudo su hyphen, or you can also do sudo dash i and then enter your password. And now I'm gonna clear the screen. So here I'm going to type uname dash mrs. And you can see here, the system has been updated to Linux kernel 6.0.1. So in this lesson, we talked about verifying the updated kernel environment. We rebooted the server and then ran the uname command to verify our current Linux version. So that's it for this lesson, verifying the environment. Please mark this lesson complete and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this section conclusion on building the kernel. In this section, we talked about downloading and extracting the source code. Here, we talked about what is source code, as well as downloading the source code. Then, we extracted the source code on our server. Next, we talked about installing the required packages. And here, we installed the required packages for our kernel build on the server. Next, we configured and build the kernel and talked about compiling the kernel, as well as installing the kernel. Then, 
we updated the bootloader and talked about what is a bootloader and then looked at our terminal to update the bootloader. Lastly, we verified the environment. So we rebooted the server and issued a command to verify the updated kernel version. But that's it for this section, building the kernel. I'll see you in the next section. Hello, and welcome to this section, customizing the kernel. In this section, after this brief introduction, we're going to talk about optimizing the kernel for the cloud. And then we'll talk about creating a Linux distribution with a part one and a part two. And then lastly, we'll wrap up our section with our section conclusion. So mark this lesson complete and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome to this lesson, Optimizing the Kernel for Cloud. In this lesson, we'll talk about what makes a Linux kernel ideal to run in the cloud, as well as some things that you can do to fine tune your kernel to run more efficiently in the cloud. So in this lesson, we'll talk about what is the cloud and optimizing the kernel for the cloud. So the cloud is an environment that runs databases and applications and is accessed over the internet. So the cloud refers to an environment that includes servers, storage, databases, and applications. So the term the cloud is widely used, but it can be used to refer to any one of those resources. So there are a few reasons we may want to optimize a kernel for the cloud. It runs processes over the internet, so they're subject to performance lag. And this means they should be as small and efficient as possible to increase responsiveness. Also, the cloud consists of shared resources that are pooled as requested. So we'll also want our cloud kernel to be less resource intensive and use the minimum amount of resources needed. So there are some steps that you can take to optimize the kernel for both of these reasons. And these settings have to be configured in the build phase during the make menu config step. Now you need to understand the settings that you're disabling because they may be a dependency for something else. So only disable a feature if you know what it is and what it does. So here are some optimizations from Linux.com to optimize our kernel and we can use these optimizations for non-cloud kernels as well. So one option to increase responsiveness is the code maturity level. So in here, we can uncheck the prompt for development and or incomplete code drivers. You'd need this option only if you're developing and testing something in the kernel. We can also look at the general setup and uncheck CPU set support, unless you have more than one processor. Dual and quad-core processors count as more than one. So in the block layer, uncheck everything unless you have disks that are larger in size than two terabytes. And then at the processor type and features, uncheck symmetric multiprocessing support unless you have more than one processor or a duo or quad one. You can also look at kernel hacking and uncheck everything since you won't be doing kernel development. So now, here are some things that we can look at to save memory. In networking, uncheck amateur radio support. This is for connecting to amateur radio. The other options are usually marked with an M for the module, so we can leave them as is. And then in file systems, we're going to verify that everything is marked with an M. If you won't be using a file system type, you could uncheck the corresponding option, or you can just leave it in as a module. And then under file systems and partition types, just uncheck anything that isn't valid. In device drivers, we're going to look through all of these and compare our devices. This is a spot where you can remove a lot of drivers or hardware that you aren't using to optimize and slim down your kernel. You can uncheck them or mark them with an M. You probably aren't using SCSI or ISDN hardware, so these options you can usually disable. And then check your manufacturer specifications for the hardware in your cloud and in the instance of bus options, you'll check your motherboard spec. You can disable EISA and MCA support unless your motherboards use these buses. So then you would save your configuration and exit 
then continue with the remaining steps for compiling and installing your kernel. So now we'll take a look at our terminal for optimizing the kernel for the cloud. And we'll look at those options that we just discussed for performance lag to increase responsiveness and safe memory. And we're going to use the make menu config command. So we're going to do an ls and we're going to cd into the Linux kernel directory. Then we'll clear the screen. And the part of the kernel build process that we're going to look at these options in is the make menu config option. Now let's look at some of the options that we discussed to save memory. So in networking, we can uncheck amateur radio support if it's selected. Here it isn't, so we can go ahead and skip past that. So you can mark it with an M to build the module, or you can just leave it how it is. And then press Escape Escape to go back. And then we're going to go down into our file systems option. And here we can verify that everything here is marked with an M. And anything that's marked with an asterisk is already a built-in. Then you can go into your device drivers and look through all of these options and compare them to your devices. This is a spot where you can remove a lot of drivers for hardware that you're not using in order to optimize your kernel. And you can uncheck them or mark them with an M to leave them as a module. Again, you probably aren't using SCSI or ISDN hardware. So if SCSI device support is selected, you can uncheck that as well. Again, go through all of the options within your configuration and make sure that you remove anything that doesn't directly tie to your hardware specification. So then after you search through all of these options, you would go ahead and go down to the bottom and select save and then exit. Then continue with the remaining steps for compiling and installing your kernel. And these would include running the make, make modules install, and make install commands. And if you need a refresher on running the remaining commands, you can go back to the last section to review those lessons. But in this lesson, we talked about what is the cloud and that the cloud is built with servers, storage, databases, and applications. And it most commonly runs over the internet. And it shares pooled resources. We also talked about optimizing your kernel to run in the cloud by using the make menu config command. But that's it for this lesson, optimizing the kernel for the cloud. Mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this lesson, Creating a Linux Distribution, Part 1. In this lesson, we'll talk about what is a Linux distribution, as well as the components needed to build out a distro. So let's go ahead and get started. So a Linux distribution is commonly referred to as an operating system. And the kernel is only a piece of the software that acts as the brain and an interface between the hardware and its processes. A distro includes specific users, libraries, runtimes, and a default set of executables. So the key takeaway here is that an operating system is a generic term for any distribution. But to become a distribution, you need a specific set of applications, users, libraries, and executables. And then you can market that as a specific distro. So a distro consists of hardware, the kernel space, and it's an operating system. And then it also, since it's an operating system, includes the user space, which includes user programs, application programs, and libraries, and system program. So all of these things together make up the operating system and your specific Linux distribution. So the components needed to build out a distro are additional packages to tailor your distribution to a specific use case. It should include a desktop environment to make it user-friendly for all kinds of users or targeted to the users for that specific distro. And it should also include user accounts so that people can log in and use the interface as a distribution. So in this lesson, we talked about what is a Linux distro and that it includes hardware, the kernel space, and additional things which make it an operating system. 
including user programs, application programs and libraries, as well as system programs. And then we talked about the components needed to build out a distro, which include additional packages, a desktop environment, and users to use our distribution. So that's it for this lesson, Creating a Linux Distribution, Part 1. Please mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this lesson, Creating a Linux Distribution, Part 2. In this lesson, we'll talk about how to build a Linux distribution, as well as the Linux from Scratch project which is an easy project that's commonly used to build Linux distros. So in the last section, building your own kernel, we talked about creating the build environment. And this included preparing for the kernel build and setting up a virtual machine. Then we talked about building the kernel, including downloading and extracting the source code for the kernel and installing the required kernel packages. Then we configured and built our kernel updated the bootloader, and verified the environment. So the last section was very centered around building a Linux kernel. And in this lesson, we're going to build on that kernel to create a distribution. So in this lesson, we're going to look at a project at www.linuxfromscratch.org. And we're going to start with an introduction to the project and the book that's included for free with this open source project, Linux from scratch. Then we'll prepare for our Linux distribution build. And this will tell you all the moving pieces that you need to have in place before starting your build. Next, we'll look at building the Linux from scratch cross toolchain and temporary tools. And this includes building the toolchain and any tools that you need to create your distribution. Then we're going to build the Linux from scratch system. And this isn't just a kernel build, as I mentioned before, but we'll be building a full Linux distribution. Then we'll look at the appendices for the project. So this is a huge process to first build the kernel and then build a distribution. But this project, as I mentioned before, is an open source project for the open source community and gives step-by-step -step instructions on the full process of building a Linux distribution. So we won't actually build a distribution in this lesson because it takes a lot of time that our environment just doesn't support. But I will walk you through all of the steps to build your own Linux from scratch system. So in this demo, we'll look at the Linux from scratch project at www.linuxfromscratch.org. So let's go ahead and get started. So open up your favorite web browser and go to www linuxfromscratch.org. And here on the first screen, we see a welcome to Linux from scratch. Here it states that it's a project that provides us with step-by-step -step instructions for building our own custom Linux system entirely from Linux kernel source code. And the Linux from scratch organization consists of the following sub projects. The Linux from scratch main book, which is the base for which all other projects are built upon. And then if you get through that successfully and you want to learn more, you can go into Beyond Linux from Scratch, which helps you extend your finished system with more customized and usable tools. There's also an automated Linux from Scratch that provides tools for automating and managing your builds. And the Hints project is a collection of documentation to explain how to enhance your system with tools and utilities that aren't included in the Linux from scratch main book and the beyond Linux from scratch project. If you'd like to learn more, there's a series of patches that serve as a central repo with anything that you'll need to create a Linux from scratch system. Then we also have an editor's guide, which is a document that describes our development process. Lastly, we have a museum and this is an archive of ancient Linux from scratch and beyond Linux from scratch version. So, to work with the Linux from scratch project, you'll want to click on the LFS link. And that will then take you to this page. So it says, what is Linux from scratch? And basically, it's a project that provides you with step-by-step -step instructions on building a customized distribution and reasons you would want to build a Linux from scratch system. 
So one reason is that it teaches people how to use a Linux system and how it works internally. And it produces a very compact Linux system that you can customize your build to meet your environment. Also, Linux from scratch is extremely flexible. So you can basically install any of the utilities and packages that you'd like to create your own distro. And then it also offers you added security. You're compiling the whole system from source, and this allows you to audit anything that you wish to do or not to do. So in this way, you can get rid of any of the security holes or features that may open security loopholes. And then what can I do with my Linux from scratch system? And basically, the Linux from scratch book is designed to provide a strong base where you can add any packages to your distro that you would like. So now we're going to go over to the menu and we can either download the book or we can read it online. So to go through it here with you for this demonstration, I'm going to select read online. So go ahead and click that tab. And here you see read the Linux from scratch book online. There are two versions available for viewing online, the stable released book and the daily rendered development book. We're going to stick to the latest stable release. So we're going to look at the stable released book. So if we look here at current stable, we see the stable Linux from scratch errata. And this is the software packages and utilities that are rendered stable for the build. We have security advisories that go along with this build. And here is our stable LFS book. So go ahead and click on the link stable LFS. And this opens our Linux from scratch version 11.2. And this was published on September 1st of 2022. This is updated on a regular basis, so your version may be newer, but the format for the book is going to stay the same. So it starts here with a table of contents with your preface, with a forward audience, target architectures, prerequisites, LFS and standards, rationale for the packages used in the book, the typography, the structure, and the errata and the security advisories that are included for this version. Then we'll go into our introduction. And this tells you how to build a Linux from scratch system, what's new since the latest release, the change log that outlines all of the changes that were made to the book, the resources that were used, and a small help section as well. So you'll want to go through the preface and the introduction before you start preparing for the build. So in section two, preparing for the build, we see the host system requirements, how to build LFS in stages, including creating a new partition, creating a file system on that partition, setting the LFS variable, and mounting the new partition. So all of this is included to prepare the host system for the distribution build. Then we have the packages and patches. They're included in this errata. We have an introduction to what packages will be used a listing of all packages in their description as shown here, and it shows the homepage for the software as well as the link for the download. And if you click on any one of these, it will give you the full description of every package, what it does and where it's located. Then we have listed our needed packages, and these are the packages that are needed for your distribution. So while you're going through this book, make sure that you don't skip any sections because everything that's done in the beginning adds to the finished project. Then we have our final preparations. And again, this full section is just in preparation for the build. So this includes creating a limited directory layout in a Linux from scratch system, adding a user, setting up the environment, and then about SBUs and about the test suite. In section three, it talks about building the LFS cross toolchain and temporary tools. This includes the introduction, toolchain technical notes, and general compilation instructions on how to compile the software. Then it dives into compiling a cross toolchain. And this talks about the bin utils, the GCC library, the API headers, the glibc library, and the live STDC. So you'll want to follow the instructions to build these tools to a T as well to make sure that nothing is missed in your distro. Then we'll go into cross-compiling temporary tools. And this talks about M4, Incurses, Bash, the core utilities, the diff utils, file, find utils, gawk, grep, gzip, make, 
patch, SCD, TAR, XZ, Benutils, and GCC. So if you haven't figured it out already, we are literally building everything from scratch in this distribution. And there are instructions for each part as you move ahead. After those tools are compiled, we're going to enter change root and build additional temporary tools that are used to build our distro. This includes changing ownership, preparing a virtual kernel file system, entering the change root environment, which is really just a virtual root environment to complete your build, creating directories, and creating essential files and sim links. Then it talks about git text, bison, Perl, python, text info, and util linux. And then lastly, cleaning up and saving the temporary system. Then in section four, we get into building the LFS system, and it talks about installing basic system software. It goes into package management, man pages, and an extensive list of packages that are needed for the environment. Again, you'll want to work through these one by one, reading about each package and following the instructions provided. Then you'll learn about debugging symbols, stripping, and cleaning up the environment. Next, it talks about system configuration, and it touches on boot scripts, an overview of device and module handling, how to manage your devices, general network configuration, system v boot script usage and configuration, the bash startup files, creating the input RC file, and creating the shells file. And then they show you how to make your LFS system bootable. And then in the end, using Linux 5.19.2, and using Grub to set up the boot process. Then it walks you right through to the ending. It talks about the end, get counted, rebooting the system, and what you can do next. Then in section five, it has the appendices for each of these utilities if you would like more information on those as well. And then these are also covered in the man pages if you'd like more information there. And then lastly, we have our index. So that is the complete overview of building a Linux distribution with the Linux from Scratch project located at linuxfromscratch.org. And again, you'll want to use the latest stable book to make sure that there aren't any bugs or flaws in your process. And also, be sure to go through the preface and introduction thoroughly. And also, don't skip any steps in preparing for the build and building the cross tool chain and temporary tools, because these are the foundation for your new Linux distribution. But that's it for this demonstration on the Linux from scratch project used to build a full Linux distribution located at www.linuxfromscratch.org. And please keep in mind that this is a lot of information to work through. So you may want to carve that out in chunks and set goals to get through each piece until you have your finished distribution. So in this lesson, we talked about how to build a distribution, and the Linux from scratch project. But that's it for this lesson, creating a Linux distribution, part two. Mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this lesson. Our conclusion on this section on customizing the kernel. In this section, we talked about what is the cloud, and that the cloud consists of servers, storage, databases, and applications. And most of the time, it runs over the internet. It also shares pooled resources. And then we talked about optimizing the kernel for the cloud. And here, we talked about the changes that can be made with the make menu config command. Next, in creating a Linux distribution part one, we talked about what is a Linux distro and the components needed to build a distribution. In creating a Linux distribution part two, we talked about the Linux from scratch project and where it's located at www.linuxfromscratch.org. But that's it for this lesson, conclusion to customizing the kernel. Hello and welcome to this course conclusion for build your own Linux kernel from scratch. In this course, we started with a brief introduction and high-level overview of the topics and configurations that we discussed in this course. And I also told you a bit about myself 
and my background as your training architect. Then we talked about creating the build environment. And in this section, we discussed the differences between kernels, operating systems, and distros, preparing for the build, and setting up our virtual machine. Then we hopped into building the kernel, where we downloaded and extracted our source code and installed the required packages. Then we configured and built our kernel, updated the bootloader, and verified the environment. We also had a hands-on lab on building your own Linux kernel. Next, we jumped into customizing the kernel. And here we talked about optimizing the kernel for the cloud and creating a Linux distribution with a part one and a part two, as well as a quiz on creating your own Linux kernel. And we're closing out our course with this conclusion and brief summary of the topics and the configurations that we discussed and performed within this course. So if you liked the course content, be sure to give a big thumbs up on the course as well as the lesson. But go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next lesson where we'll talk about what could be next for you on your educational journey with a Cloud Goo. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, what's next? We'll talk about what could be next for you on your educational journey with a Cloud Guru. So I have some other courses published that you may be interested in, such as Linux User Management Deep Dive, Linux File Sharing, Linux Web Services, Linux Network Client Management, and Linux System Security. So go ahead and check out any of those other courses if you'd like to learn more about the Linux operating system. And again, if you enjoyed the content in the course, please leave a big thumbs up on all of the lessons in the labs as well as the quiz. But that's it for this lesson, what's next? Go ahead and mark this lesson complete, and I'll see you in the next course.